Let me hear it. I would like to officially welcome you to the official opening of the very official World Summit on Technological Unemployment. <laughs> Creative destruction. That term is supposed to be at the very heart of capitalism. I would describe that concept as the disruption to an economy from innovation, leading to the suffering of some, particularly via unemployment, and yet theoretically with the creation of more wealth eventually for all. Capitalists have been willing to tolerate and usually even unreservedly champion creative destruction in economics because the historical observation has been that it creates more net new jobs than it destroys. It has also been historically observed that the people who lose their jobs are not usually the same ones who get the new types of jobs. And when that job loss and the associated economic anxiety and deprivation is high enough, the politics gets very negative on the left and on the right in that environment of perceived and real personal chaos. One could argue that the history of the modern world, say since the Industrial Revolution over three centuries ago, is the history of creative destruction. Or to put it another way, the history of the modern world is the history of technological unemployment. New technologies create new innovations, which create new industries that compete with and disrupt already existing industries, thereby losing jobs. Politicians, political parties, and in many cases, revolutionaries, seek to position themselves in order to capitalize, no pun intended, on the disruption. Many of the so-called techno-optimists and the vast majority of capitalists argue that creative destruction due to technological innovation will continue to play out positively in the coming years and perhaps even without much of a hitch. The most intense techno-pessimists think we are headed for a job copolypse that will unravel civilization and that there is no way to avoid it. Today we will learn much that will help you decide where you stand on the immense historical drama that has begun to unfold. I am the founder and chairman of the World Technology Network, the group that convened this meeting today. The WTN, as many call it, is a global community of the peer elected, most innovative people and organizations in science and technology and related fields. We give out the annual World Technology Awards in 20 different categories including not only the SciTech fields of IT hardware, software, communications technology, biotech, health, energy, materials, and space, but also such fields as the arts, design, ethics, education, environment, policy, and many more. The winners and finalists of the awards become our fellows, and we now have over 1,000 fellows spread out over 40 countries. They are elected by their peers for doing the work of the greatest likely long-term significance. That's the criterion. We present the awards in a ceremony at the end of our annual two-day World Technology Summit. The next one is occurring here in this room, November 19th and 20th, and we hope you're here with us. The point I'm trying to make is not only that I hope you join us then, but that the WTN is truly in touch with those creating many of the actual innovations that are already or soon to disrupt virtually every industry and every aspect of civilization. I cannot promise that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I know that I have been exposed to the information and the people that has led me to the believe that I just might. So a core question to ask ourselves is this. Is there something fundamentally different about our time? One, in the past, 
technological innovation on a scale truly disruptive to an industry or a way of life occurred perhaps every few decades. People had more time to adjust. Two, in the past, truly disruptive technological innovation did not occur in every industry at once. People could have more options to move to an undisrupted industry. Three, in the past, the economy built upon disruptive innovation was not fully globalized. People had more options to emigrate to different parts of the world or even within their own country to find undisrupted industries in which to work. Four, in the past, most developing world countries were growing in population, not aging. The developed world countries were growing in population, not aging, and with a shrinking working age population, as is the case, for example, now in Europe and Russia and Japan, putting even more pressure on interest in non-human labor to make up the gap. Five, in the past, most economically poor or developing countries weren't so populated and growing so rapidly, putting even more pressure on job creation to maintain hard fought for standards of living for already underemployed citizens, let alone to continue to raise them. Six, in the past, average life expectancy was around three or four decades, and prime working years fit into that much shorter lifespan. Now, not only has life expectancy grown over the past century, to reach six, seven, or eight plus decades, but new biotechnology and other medical advances are leading many scientists to think that truly significant life extension is possible in the coming decades. In short, in the past, people didn't work as many years and then they retired, unable to work as well as before, creating job openings for their younger colleagues. This too is changing. Seven, and most importantly, in the past, most new technologies did not have the truly transformative and multi-purpose power of so many of the newest technologies today or those coming soon. In the past, a human almost always did the job better. And although machine labor has always enhanced human labor or be been good at doing things that require brute strength or repetitive tasks, we have long held the place of privilege when it came to the mind intelligence, and certainly creativity. This is no longer as true as it once was, and that is a true revolution, perhaps eventually the final one. For the past few years, I have given talks about what I call the phase change of human civilization. A phase change is when, for example, liquid water turns to ice or steam. It is when the elements are the same but are structured entirely differently. I think more change, largely driven by technological innovation, is coming in the next 20 to 30 years than in the last two to 3,000. This is a civilizational phase change. We are gaining elemental control over the building blocks of life. We are on the verge of full control over matter with the power to make anything out of anything, anytime, anywhere. We are certainly well on our way to mastering information and data and the full range of the prose and poetry of its capabilities and capacities, a form of deep magic we know so well in our own heads. And I haven't even mentioned artificial intelligence, which although down the road a bit in its possible full birth as the ultimate game changer, it doesn't take full machine sentience to change things enormously. Types of machine intelligence built along the path toward AI could replace an enormous amount of the need for human intelligence, just as likely as it supports it and enhances it. In short, all the assumptions of human civilization and how it has, has had to be structured are up for grabs. Our daily lives, our collective cultures, our politics, our economics, and certainly our work, and the nature of and need for it, have started to change in ways so profound an entire society can seem dizzy, and certainly the future seems unprecedentedly hazy. The power of these new complex technologies, advanced software, robotics, 3D printing, disintermediation via the internet, cutting edge brain science, and other medical 
uh, breakthroughs, just to name a few. The speed they are hitting in almost every country and in almost every industry, with so many more people living longer and able to work longer, taken all together, mean we've got an unarguably large and unique perfect storm. To expect that all of this won't create massive unemployment challenges over the next couple decades and beyond is either incredibly naive or frankly impressively delusional. So that brings us to the idea of preparation. We need to be thinking about what is happening to our civilization and we need to be exploring scenarios about what could happen. Many people, perhaps billions, will almost certainly visit dystopia in the next few decades if we ignore the implications on employment of this phase change. The World Summit on Technological Unemployment is the first high-level conference and workshop for thought leaders across all disciplines and domains designed to begin the critical task of confronting the vast challenges ahead. The goal of the summit is to begin to catalyze a proactive partnership of the brightest minds in academia, government policy, industry, and the media so that they and we can construct a framework to define, measure, and ultimately craft solutions to the jobless future that increasingly faces our global workforce. As a first step, after this event, we're going to be sending out the video webcast of what occurs at this event along with associated reports to the office of all the world's political leaders, to the leaders of finance ministries, labor ministries, central banks, and so on. Our social peace, education system, industrial forecasting, social welfare system, tax policy, geopolitical alignments, and so much more are all at play. It is not an exaggeration to say that the very character of civilization itself is at stake. Therefore, I would hope you share with me the conviction that we need to be asking ourselves three additional questions. One, what are the primary challenges we likely face regarding these issues in the world heading toward massive technological disruption around the need for human labor? Two, what new strategies regarding these issues would need to be developed and created in order to address these challenges, and three, what actions should we take now regarding these issues to speed up the move to a stable and equitable society with little required human labor? Right after me today and throughout the day, we're going to hear both in person and by video hookup about the potential answers to these questions with some of the most knowledgeable, experienced, and creative thinkers, influencers, and policymakers on these topics. And I would like to add that every single speaker and almost all the staff working on this event volunteered their time and effort for not a cent of money for the good of us all. So just pause for a moment and thank the speakers and the staff for doing this. Mid-afternoon, we're all going to be led through a facilitated idea generation process by one of America's top policy facilitators to seek together to answer those three questions, focusing on these specific areas of great relevance, education, politics, employment itself, and income distribution and the social safety net. By the way, you may hear some of the speakers today say similar things. That is good. For an event that is in part about exploring a crucial issue, the fact that so many smart people think that we have to prepare ourselves for something quite significant underscores the very need for that exploration. I'd like to begin to close my remarks with some personal comments. The truth is that the coming wave of technological unemployment is going to hit each of us individually, our families and our society, and when you're only going to do something about it, including even just think about it, if we care at a personal level. So, why? Why the heck did I put all this effort into organizing with my team this world, this world summit on technological unemployment? I did it for many personal reasons, but here are a few. One, I am concerned for my two teenage daughters. Their formal education is preparing them for a world that will not exist in five years, let alone 10. 
And how do I look them in the eye and encourage their career dreams while thinking that most jobs that are done by humans today soon won't require us anymore? Two, I'm worried about some nasty politics. Almost every period of great political upheaval in the past few centuries that has involved totalitarianism on the left or fascistic on the right behavior has occurred during a period or grown out of a period of large-scale unemployment and economic anxiety. When large numbers of unemployed people, particularly young men, have a loss of hope and purpose, political demagogues have found it easy to manipulate them into mob behavior. A well-respected Oxford study predicts 47% of jobs in the US will be gone due to these disruptive technologies and not replaced in less than two decades. If that doesn't make us think that this will have political implications, I don't know what would. Three, I'm hoping we make a smooth transition to the emerging new era, or smoother. It is conceivable that all of these new technologies here now and coming down the pike will generate an untold level of prosperity and opportunity for humanity, conceivable. We might be able to help our capabilities expand in ways that would have shocked even the most ambitious alchemists and even spiritualists from centuries past. And the scale of the changes coming could happen so quickly and in so many industries and other aspects of life at the same time that our cultures cannot adjust if we don't help think through in advance how they might. Indeed, the end of the drudgery of required work could be the bridge to an unprecedented period of human creativity. Four, I am deeply concerned about growing income inequality. There are those who argue quite convincingly that not only is there something inherent in modern capitalism that guarantees substantial and indeed growing income inequality, but there is something in technological innovation itself operating within that system that does so as well. And if we want all the innovation and all the societal wealth, productivity, and frankly, magic that comes with it, we need to figure out how to better distribute wealth so we don't leave people behind. And when the percentage of people that could be out of work and left behind is potentially going to grow to unprecedented levels, then we have to figure out how to create new forms of societal support and safety niche perhaps such as a universal basic income, hand in hand with our other innovations. New and bold thinking is required. Five, I am concerned for myself. There is no future I've ever imagined when I do not have a purpose in my work that uses my mind, my expertise, and my passion to give my life a daily feeling of meaning. I want to work. I truly want to work. I want to be relevant. I want all humans to feel relevant. And I want them actually to be relevant in the coming years. And together with you, I want to help figure out how we might proceed as a civilization. We are going to have a radically new civilization in the next few decades, largely driven by new technologies and their ripple effects. The phase change for our civilization is happening. Let's avoid dystopia and shoot, if not for utopia, then for something much better than what we've had and what we've got. Something much more politically and environmentally sustainable something for the first time perhaps, first time ever, that is actually morally defensible in every way. If we get creative, we can make this new civilization a better one for everyone. Let's get ahead of the curve, people. Today, together, let's start to redefine creative destruction. Are you with me? Thank you.
we are going to hear very soon 